there, welcome back to another I Care For Your Brain with board certified neuropsychologist. We are doing our top 10 brain health secrets. I hope you've been along for the ride. We have three more to go and now I'm gonna be giving you number eight. This is to be a social butterfly in your own way. Everyone is different in terms of their levels of introversion, extroversion, and it actually changes for us as individuals throughout our life. But one thing that remains the same is that we are fundamentally social animals with a social brain. Turns out the research suggests that the main difference there in terms of brain health is how we judge our time alone. So if we feel that we are lonely as opposed to being alone, this is what increases the risk of dementia later in life. So we have a threefold increase for dementia in people who identify themselves as lonely. And if we start to look at the loneliest people in these studies, they have a cognitive decline that's about 20% faster over the course of 12 years than people who are not lonely. So why I think this is important is because no matter where you fall on that spectrum of you know, loving people, hating people, is there is a very physiological fundamental need to belong, to contribute, to be a part of some type of social contract or relationship. The connections that we have, the interactions that we have, they don't have to be overly plentiful if that's not your thing, but we do have to judge them as being meaningful and satisfying. So social health, I would say, is the most recent science-based contributor to brain health. What we really understand about brain health now is that it is whole person health. You're not gonna have a great diet and do nothing for your physical body, your cardiovascular system, and have a great brain. You're not gonna to be totally stressed out, but run marathons and have a great brain. You're not going to be lonely, uh, but have you know an advanced college degree and all the money in the world. That's not gonna result in a healthy brain. What we really need people to understand is it's all of this. So what I love you to do is take my top 10 tips as a package. Try to think about how is it that I could make improvements on all of these little things. So part of the reason being social is so inherent to our, our actual literal DNA is because of social learning. So the reason we've survived as a species is really that we have understood how to share information. So communication, the ability to have an idea anywhere from where to find food all the way up to how to put the latest update on your smartphone. It really is the basis of human culture. And so we've had to develop things like understanding body language, intonation, language is believed to be developed just for the sake of social learning. And so because of that, we also have incredibly strong social bonds. We are meant to live in small groups. And part of what's happened to us through modern society is we kind of have these illusions of closeness, I think, through social media. And so what we sometimes forget is we actually need to see and touch and feel people in real life to have a real meaningful social connection. So there are actually scientists who study what is good enough social connectedness, and they have identified a couple different components I want to share with you. So you can kind of think of yourself as asking yourself these questions. So the first one that we do consider is, well, how long have we known the person? And some of that is because you have layers of experience that then tell you this person is trustworthy or not. Number two is how often do we see them? If we see them once every 10 years, that can be a different type of relationship than if we see them once every year. The another, next one is what is our knowledge of their personal goals? I think that's really interesting and gets at this whole idea of reciprocity. It's not just about what we get out of relationships. It's actually, we feel more connected the more we know about what's important to them, what their values are, what are they working towards in life. The next one is how comfortable we are with physical touch with the person, right? So there's a big difference between touching someone's hand to do a handshake or a fist bump versus an intimate hug where you would actually linger a little bit longer. The next one is self-disclosure. So what is our comfort level with telling people really how we feel, even when it's not pretty, even when it's not our best selves, 
what is the comfort level of really letting people in and letting us know what's going on with us? And the last one I think is pretty interesting is how familiar is the other person with the rest of your social circle? So it turns out we feel more connected to people when there actually is connection between different levels of our social circle. So I think sometimes this is why things like weddings are so powerful because you've got all these people coming in from all these different parts of your life and they're actually in the same room. So that can create a tremendous sense of social connection. But really what the science tells me is when we boil everything down, the question of how we really value a social connection is can we trust them to help us? And I think that's why it feels like such a betrayal if it feels like somebody knew we needed help and didn't offer, because at the end of the day, that is the essence of human connection. So like I said before, the difference is not necessarily isolation or spending too much time on your own. If you judge that as being good and satisfying and valuable, the science tells us you're okay. It's the 43% of adults that tell us that they often feel left out, that they feel isolated, that they feel like they lack companionship. So when we look at these people over the course of six years, 45% of them have a greater risk of dying earlier than older adults who said they felt more connected. Now, here's an interesting fact. 63% of them were married or living with other people. So there's an indication that being with someone and being lonely are actually um, not necessarily mutually exclusive. One of the concerns I have as a neuropsychologist that supports older adults is that there are barriers to remaining social as we age. So limited mobility, literally getting places, um, hearing loss, vision loss becomes not as easy to go out at night. People move away, people pass away. Uh, we have changes in our ability to drive. There can be financial restraints. Retirement is a huge one. Working is incredibly social for many of us, especially before uh, working from home became so popular. And Becoming a widow, uh, you're used to having your person, your very close group of friends that maybe you did things with as a couple. And then there is just good old fashioned ageism. The world is really not a very elder friendly place. And so sometimes even like opening heavy doors at department stores are things I notice as maybe this is a barrier to somebody feeling like they wanna come and do something social. So there's a lot of different issues, but what we care about tonight is what is the impact on brain health? So the way I want you to think about socialization to the degree it's satisfying to you is that it is an enriching experience. And one thing science has taught us is very simply enriched environments build better brains that are more dementia resistant. So people are quite unpredictable and novel. And that is something that the brain actually really thrives on. We love newness. We love being surprised. I mean, that's kind of the essence of humor, isn't it, right? We're delighted when something unexpected happens. And people are probably the most unpredictable stimulus we can have. So when we look at a lot of animal data, we look at a lot of human studies, it's very clear that the more socially connected you are, the more satisfied you are socially, you have greater immunity. So children who went to daycare earlier, if you track them over their lifespan, they have less autoimmune disease, including multiple sclerosis. They do get sicker while they're in the preschool or the daycare, but as adults, they tend to get less flus and colds. And part of it is just being around other people, you develop a lot more antibodies better cardiovascular health, which we all know by now helps the brain a lot, right? So the more you are with people, the more active you tend to be. Less whole body inflammation, the more socially satisfied you are less cognitive symptoms. And that is, is really something that this whole talk about is about tonight is when you are with other people, it is stimulating. You have to respond. You have to develop listening skills. I have often said that conversation is the best brain game. If you are spending any time on a tablet playing card games or 
you know, puzzles and all that, make sure you're first actually interacting with a human being and having in-depth, meaningful conversations. That is going to stimulate your brain a heck of a lot more than any type of game is going to do. And we know that those stimulations generalize into better brain health, where right now the data on the brain games is very limited in that it makes you better at the game, but it doesn't necessarily seem to provide any resistance to dementia or prevent any type of other cognitive decline. Whereas having a satisfying social life, we now know this is a buffer against succumbing to the subtypes of dementia. So I hope that was helpful for you and I hope you tune in to number nine coming right up after this. Bye. (laughs) 